Okay guys, this segment video uh, is all about percent yield. And basically, in the world of chemistry, what should happen versus what does happen. Okay, so just like in life, you know, if I give you guys a, a unit test coming up on this unit, and you know, in theory, if you studied everything and learned everything and practiced everything, you should be able to do the entire test and you should get 100% on it. Now in reality, you may not, you know, yield or you may not get 100% of what you possibly could get from that. Um, that actually happens throughout a lot of different businesses. You know, in theory, if Target puts all this stuff on their shelves, you know, they should sell 100% of the stuff that they sell. Well, the reality is they don't sell 100% of it, so some of it gets lost to theft, some of it gets lost to just nobody wants to buy it, so they have to discount the price out and change over and seasons and all that kind of different stuff. So in the world, we deal with percent yield, or basically what percentage of your possibility did you actually get out of your process, okay? Another way of looking at this is, is the term efficiency, or how efficient is the chemistry you're running. Because in the world of chemistry, different things can happen to cause you to not make as much product as you should. One, temperatures could be wrong. Two, something could block the reaction. Three, could have a contaminant. Four, the reaction might actually be reversible, which means after you make so much, it stops what happening and turns around and goes the other direction. So there's lots of reasons why it doesn't happen. Um, but we want to calculate that so in chemistry or in any type of industry, you'd like to minimize your losses. In fact, you want to increase your efficiency or increase your percent yield. Okay, so with, with doing that, we have some terminology you need to start with, and then we'll take a look at our practice problem. So basically, when we work with equations, that always tells us what should happen. Okay, so that's just, that assumes 100% yield. So the math is 100% yield, here's what's going to happen, perfect world. That's not what really always happens. So we have two different terms. Theoretical yield, that's what comes from the math. So here's what you should get in theory, all right? Uh, and then you have your actual yield. And this is what you actually get when you run the lab or do the actual experiment. Typically, your actual yield is going to be less than your theoretical yield. Now, there are cases where your actual yield can be more than your theoretical yield. In those cases, you start to look for a contaminant or something wrong with your process. Because if you're making more than what you should, something is contaminating it, or something isn't properly calculated or factored in. Because there's no chemical reaction that actually generates mass or generates extra product for that. So usually if you're generating more, or your actual yield is more than your theoretical, then you know there's actually something fundamentally wrong with either your math, or the chemistry, or you have a contaminant in your actual chemistry that you're working with. Now, the way we calculate that is by percent yield or efficiency. Again, this is nothing new to us in terms of the math. We just take what we actually got divided by what we thought we should have got in theory, take it times 100 to get a percent yield. Okay, It's very much like a percent composition type of process, but instead of ca calculating per partial divided by whole, here we're talking about how much did we make versus how much we should have made. Okay, So what we're going to do is take a look at this previous problem that we did and then add the concept of percent yield into it. So if you remember we worked on this problem with limiting reactant and we said that if we react 135 grams of tetraphosphorus decoxide with 70 grams of water that we find out that our limiting reactant is actually the tetraphosphorus decoxide. So this is what we identify as our limiting reactant. The amount of Phosphoric acid we can make is 186 grams. The excess reactant, the water, could make too much, so we crossed that out. And we said that that wasn't going to be our right answer. Now, what happens if we run the experiment and 145 grams of phosphoric acid is actually produced? Okay, so we're supposed to make 186 grams. How much would we get? Or what is our percent yield if we really made 145 grams of that of that process? So. And this thing, what we're going to do, we know what we should have gotten versus what we really did do. Okay, so let's go to the board and kind of work it out real quick. So our actual is 145 grams. Theory, remember theory comes from the math that we do. So mathematically we said we should have gotten 186 grams. All we have to do is divide those two, 
take it times 100, and that will tell us how much yield we had or how efficient our chemistry process is running. Okay? So if we do that math, we see that we have a 77.8% yield. Now notice, in my work, we have 186.417. Up here I just said 186. Originally, when we answered this original problem, we rounded off to three significant figures because this number had three significant figures here. However, anytime you need to use a number that you've calculated in additional math, you have to use the unrounded version of that. So you don't want to have 186 here because that would have changed our percentage. You want to use the unrounded version because you're still just doing multiplication division and then plug it back into your equation and solve it that way. Okay? Now, here's another one that we're going to try. Uh, you can bust 25 milliliters of liquid butane with an excess of oxygen gas. If the reaction is known to be 89.0% efficient, how many milliliters of carbon dioxide gas at STP will you actually make? Okay, so this problem, if we take a look at it, it has a pretty involved stoichiometry problem with it, but it's nothing that we can't uh, handle. So let's walk through the whole process together, and then we'll actually factor in that percent yield in our answer. Okay, so we're combusting 25 milliliters of liquid butane. So I have butane, which is C4H, four, four carbons, so four times two is eight, eight plus two is 10, so 10 hydrogens, reacting with, with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water and heat energy. I have four carbons, so I'm gonna make a four here, uh, 10 hydrogen, so I need a 5 here, so that gives me 4 times 2, 8 oxygens, plus 5 more, for 13 oxygens, that number doesn't fall real well here, uh, so 13, 6.5 times 2 would give me 13. Now, because all I need this reaction for is the ratio, I could leave it this way. Even though this is not a proper balanced equation, mathematically, I'm going to get the right answer. I'm going to change it to match the proper way of doing it. But we have 2, 13, 8, and then 10. So here's butane combusting. And now we're going to go through our stoichiometry. So I have 25 milliliters of butane. Well, I have a volume of a gas. Uh, sorry, I have a volume of a liquid here, so I want to actually get into grams. So my first step is to use that density that we see in the end of the problem, where it says 0.599 grams per milliliter. So since the density is 0 0.599 grams of butane per one milliliter, butane will start that way. And then we know that we can do our grams butane for every one mole of butane. And then we do our mole ratio. So butane is a two, so I have two moles of butane. And the problem says, how much carbon dioxide am I gonna make? So I'm gonna go to carbon dioxide, which is eight moles of carbon dioxide and finally the problem says I have carbon dioxide gas at STP so I know that for every one mole of CO2 I get 22.4 liters of CO2 but the question asks me for it in milliliters so I have liters so my last step for every one liter of CO2, I get 1,000 milliliters of CO2. Okay. 
Kind of a long process. We had to use density, we had to use molar volume, we had to convert with, with some metric stuff, so more complex, but definitely something that is um, doable and something I can definitely assess you on. The one place I still have to fill in is our uh, molar mass of butane. So for carbon, we have a mass of 12.01 times 4, which gives me 48.04. Hydrogen, hydrogen is 1.01 times 10, so that gives me 10.10 for a mass of 58.14. So add in 58.14 grams there, and now we're ready to solve this process. So I take my 25.0 times 0.599, divide by 58.14, times 8, divided by 2, times 22.4, times a thousand, and I'll get to my answer, okay? So let's punch this into the calculator now. And when we punch it into the calculator, we get a value of 2.0378 times 10 to the fourth milliliters of carbon dioxide. Very reasonable number. You know, we have 25 milliliters of a liquid. We know that gases are less dense, so we should expect thousands of milliliters of carbon dioxide to be produced from this. So very realistic here. Okay. Now, the last step of this process is we're only 89% efficient. Okay. So in theory, we should make 2.0378 times 10 to the fourth milliliters. The reality is we're only going to get 0.89% of that, okay? So we're going to get 89% of this value, which means we need to figure out how much will we actually make. So our last step here is to take this number times the 0.89 to solve for x. Take the this times the 0.89, solving for x, and then we get to our final answer. Now, another way of doing this is instead of just putting into the equation, what you can do is in your stoichiometry, you can add a step and say this math should be 100% yield, but I'm actually only going to get 0.89% yield. So you know that you're getting 89% yield over 100% yield. So you could actually put this into the math and solve for it also. In either case, you would come up with the right answer. Okay? So if we go back to the screen then, we can see all the work laid out. And we have our 2.31 times 10 to the fourth milliliters that we should use. We actually use the unrounded number to solve for the actual what we made. Take it times 0.89 and we actually will get 2.05 times 10 to the fourth milliliters. Okay? Chemists use this in the industry on a daily basis because they know how efficient their machines are. They know how efficient their processes are. So when they're factoring in how much to use, how much to take out, what they do is they actually calculate in their error. They calculate in their efficiencies so that they know what they're going to produce. So this is a very key step in terms of doing our math is factoring in what our error is. All right, guys, that ends this video on percent yield. Uh, we'll do some more practice in class. Thank you.